for New Year's in 2000, my dad was a bartender. My mom was a waitress at a party and they took me and my brother. And so all night and they were working it. Right. So it's sort of like that, that work ethic that they showed me that sure, there's other people partying and celebrating. And my parents are out there uh, working for the future for my brother and I. It's been crazy because now they have the time to take off from work and work whenever they want to. The sacrifice has paid off and a lot of people may see them now, but they, I always try to remind other people too. It's like, we started from zero. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a long-time listener or a first-time listener, it's always an honor to have you back for another episode. The title of today's episode is Meet the Immigrant Who Became a Millionaire with Real Estate. This is an interview with Diego Corso. He is originally from Peru. His family moved here when he was a kid. And this is just an incredible story. I feel like it's the prototypical, the perfect American story because it shows how resilient uh, Diego and his family had to be both getting here, even going to high school and college for Diego as a smart student. How do you finance college? How do you pay for things? How do you get started in real estate investing when you have no, very few resources? Just from one step to another, I think you'll be inspired. I think you'll get lots of practical ideas that you can apply from the strategies you might've heard of like house hacking, but also using a real estate license, partnering with other people where you don't have a skill or you don't have a resource, finding other people who do. The story is packed with those kinds of tips that'll both inspire you, but also educate you. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Diego. Now, before we get to the interview, it's time for my weekly behind the scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what's going on with me and my real estate investing finances or business behind the scenes. So this week, I want to talk again about travel. Several of my last few episodes, I've, of course, talked about a trip that my wife and I and my family are taking to Spain. We're going to live there for a year with our family. And I want to make a recommendation. This is something that I personally feel very strongly about, and especially after having this conversation today, the interview you're going to listen to with Diego, who came from another country and moved to the United States. We often have the opportunity to meet people who come from other countries and move here to the United States. I think that's an incredible opportunity for cultural richness and to learn different backgrounds. But my recommendation is something that's been really meaningful to me as well, is to travel to other countries. So I know it's a, it's a luxury opportunity to be able to get on an airplane and go places. It costs money to do that. It takes time away from your job. But even if you're not kind of crazy like we are leaving for a year, even going for a week or two somewhere and getting to immerse yourself just in what how things are done in a different place. And sometimes getting off the typical kind of tourist uh, you know, travel agenda, which is nice too, you know, to go to places and see the, the sites there, but just doing the normal things. Like for me, it's going to a market and seeing how people buy groceries and food. That's always an amazing experience. Sitting in a park and watching people just walk around, going near a school and seeing how people go to school and walk their kids to school or take kids to school and just seeing the, uh, you know, everyday life. There are so many interesting things and going there without an agenda of trying to figure out this is better or worse or anything like that and just like absorbing it. It is a growth experience. It's a humbling experience. And so just my suggestion, this has been a huge growth experience for me and a positive in my life. It's just if you have that opportunity, whenever it might come, whether it's now, 10 years from now, take it. It's an amazing experience to do that. You can start in a place that you're familiar with or maybe more comfortable with and kind of dip your toes in the water and then maybe go somewhere you're very uncomfortable with. Maybe somewhere you've heard on the news has a certain reputation or heard certain things, but often what you find is they're very, there are people there that you meet who are incredible. And it's a, the story might be a little bit different than what you hear on the news. So I know that's a little bit preachy today, a little bit more of a suggestion than a behind the scenes tour, but just want to give you that idea and that thing that's been really impactful for me behind the scenes in my life has really influenced a lot of what I do in business and investing and my perspective in general. So hope you have an opportunity to do that. That's my behind the scenes segment for today. If you like these behind the scenes segments, I want to invite you to stay in touch with me beyond the podcast by checking out one of the online courses that I offer. Online courses are a way to interact with me and let me help you with your real estate investing. 
Some courses are available anytime and others like my premier course, Real Estate Deal School, is more of a live boot camp style course where you and other students go through the course with me live and I help you step by step in buying your next investment property. You can get details on all of these courses at coachcarson.com forward slash courses. Now let's get started with today's interview. Hey, Diego, welcome to the podcast. What is up, Chad? Very happy to be here. Yeah, this is awesome. It's a long time coming. We, uh, I think we met originally, maybe 2017, we were at a conference and I, you know, I, I, I never missed an opportunity. You introduced yourself, but I was like, okay, I'm going to try to practice my Spanish a little bit here. And we, we hablamos por dos minutos y then we went to English just like this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, but, uh, it was great, to, great talking to you then. And, uh, I want to I want to talk a lot today about your real estate portfolio, what you're doing. You're in Austin, Texas. You're a real estate agent with a successful business, and uh, just kind of get some some very practical tips to be to everyone. But I, I love going back and talking about your story and and where where it all started. And for you, could you tell me a little bit about kind of your your childhood and where where you came from, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a crazy journey, and. What's okay? So I met you but right in 2017, yeah. and I have been following all of your like your blogs and everything, your YouTube videos, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's Coach Carson. I need to go say hi, and uh, yeah. So I was I was like, it was more for me. It was like, holy crap, I need to introduce myself. So. <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I, rem I remember your, your, your house hacking, you were talking about getting, how you gotten started. And yeah, it was, it was a fun conversation. It was also fun for, to try to translate some of those terms to Spanish, which for me was just, it did, didn't work. I was like, all right, this is, I got to expand my vocabulary here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, yeah, so I'm a real estate investor and an agent. Um, and I do have houses, properties, all of that stuff. But my journey basically started when I came to the United States when I was nine years old from Peru. I came here with a visa um, with my parents. And then after six months, we decided to overstay. And that meant that we became undocumented. So it didn't really hit me that I was undocumented until I turned 15 years old when it was my turn to get my driver's license. And at that point, I was like, um, I go to the DMV and they said that with, with the documents that I, with the lack of documents, I couldn't get that. Um, and then I put all my emphasis into school. I graduate high school third in my class. I'm doing everything that they told me, right? Get good grades. You'll get into a good college. And uh, so I did that. And then I stumbled into the, the lack or the lack of opportunity for me to be able to get student loans for financial aid because I was an American. And then um, thankfully I did win some scholarships, some were taken back. I go to college at Florida State University and then I got an internship working for free. In between that time, they tell me, hey Diego, we wanna hire you. So I'm 19 years old, I'm like, great, this is gonna be my way to pay for college. And uh, at that point, I also found out that I couldn't legally work. I don't have a work permit. Um, I didn't know all this until, yeah, so I'm 19 years old. I cannot work, cannot drive, can't get student loans. Um, but when I was 20 years old, my buddy Pascal throws me a book and he's like, you have to read this. And it was Rich Dad Poor Dad. And uh, in it, it shares that there's two ways for people to make money. You can either trade your time for money or make your money work for you. And that was the first time that actually like, I knew that we came here to the United States to achieve the quote unquote, the American dream, right? But I didn't know how, not easy, but the path, how simple, simple is a word that you can build wealth and real estate is one of those ways. So I set a goal. I was like, by the time that I'm 35, I'm gonna own 10 properties. I wanna build this passive income. I didn't know how I was going to do it, right? Because the book, number one, doesn't teach you anything on how to do stuff, just changes your mindset. And then it's up to you to go and read other stuff. Um, so I graduated high school, I mean, college. And that was at the time when the Obama administration passes the executive action for the dreamer. So I am technically a dreamer, what Congress calls that. And I'm part of, of the DACA program which basically allows people like me uh, who came here as kids to be able to work and drive 
legally in the United States, and they basically cannot deport us. Um, I mean, they can, but it's deferred, basically. Um, so it's been a crazy journey because it wasn't until, like, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad when I was 20. At 22, I was able to work and drive, graduated college. Because of that, I moved to Austin, Texas to work as a software developer for General Motors. And that was like a blessing in disguise because I was a software developer for two years for them. And then I saw that the market was booming too. Like I just saw little things here and there and I'm like, I need to buy a house. And um, I saw that in me reading, right, seeing what I could do to decrease my expenses, I stumbled into house hacking. And I was like, I need to house hack here in Austin. Uh, and those were one of my first, uh, my first steps into getting my, into number one, getting my investment property, my first house hack. Um, and I can share the numbers and, and all of that too. But now I bought my first house at 23. 24 and then now I have a portfolio of 47 doors and I'm in three syndications and I'm still undocumented right so I share this with a crazy journey and and I'll share more about that too of everything that happened um but yeah it's been a crazy journey lots of ups and downs but it's me going to like my belief of achieving the American dream Wow, just so many incredible threads of that story that I want to get into, Diego, and just yeah. and, and I want to go back to just to your to your family, to your parents, and I'm curious mm -hmm. if you, do you have any stories that you remember from maybe from before you came, but when your parents were in Peru, like what 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 were they doing at that point, and maybe what was some of the motivation to to move and 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 and, and look for other opportunities as you talk about in a, in a different country. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So basically, we moved here in 1999. And around that time in Peru, uh, my dad, he couldn't find a job uh, at all. Uh, my mom was, my mom was, she was working at a bank. Uh, but we had literally had our car got stolen. So not broken into, it got stolen completely. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out that it appeared a couple of days later with like no wheels, no nothing or whatever at a shop. Um, my mom, um, she had been robbed at gunpoint and then later with a knife. So it, it just wasn't safe. Um, so it was more from the perspective of like, okay, we can stay here and things can be okay. Uh, but what can we do if we were to go to the United States and basically start a new life? Right. And, uh, they were 33 and I was nine and my brother was three years old at that time. What part of uh, Peru were you in? Were you in Lima or another part of the country? I was in Lima. Lima, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if I told you this, Diego. This is kind of a side story, but when um, my wife and I in 2009, this is before we had kids, we we traveled to to South America and went to Peru and actually lived in Arequipa for for about oh, a, nice. a month and a half. And and I, that's where I learned to speak Spanish. Like I spoke a little bit, you know, before that, but um, went to classes every day in Arequipa and lived with a the family there. And then I, the, the thing that this impression for me, obviously, there's in every country, right? There's, there's challenges mm -hmm. and where you were living, there was, you know, there's some, just some opportunities you felt were elsewhere. But the other thing that we just were so impressed by the culture, by the food, by the music, by the people in Peru. And just, it was just, just an amazing culture of, of, of a place. So it was just yes. really made an impression on us. Yes. No. And the food is amazing. And my grandpa is actually from, from Arequipa. So I've been there in, in the past and the food is amazing. We party, we dance a lot. Yeah. Uh, you probably saw that too. Like we party hard. Um, yeah. I love salsa dancing and, uh, but the culture is very rich. The food is very rich in flavor too. Um, it just happens that there's a lot of corruption too, unfortunately. And, um, but yeah, the culture is great. Yeah. So I, that was just a side story so for people who get to also visit Peru, just think it's, it's one of those amazing places you got to like, you got to put that on your list. And, yeah. but I just, I find it amazing for your, from your parents' standpoint that here you are in the situation that, you know, you said it could be okay, but you know, you're, it's not, not. And so we want to make this change, this life, huge life change where you mm -hmm. take your kids who are nine and three, you move to another country. And I'm just curious when, when you first started, like just for people to get a perspective of what that, mm -hmm. what that journey is like, like, yeah. do you remember some of the, the milestones or, th or some of the steps you had to take when your, your parents are just trying to get their foot, their foot footing in the new, a new country? 
Yeah. Um, so we moved here with around, I believe, like six to eight thousand dollars. And uh, that's all we had. We moved to my aunt's house. Um, so basically meant that my brother and I, we slept in the top of a bunk bed and my mom and I and my mom and my dad, um, they slept in the bottom part of the bunk bed. Um, so it was like four of us to one room. And uh, our first car, actually, we call it the ghost train or in Spanish, el tren fantasma. Uh, so because it was a van that they bought for like 800 or 900 dollars. But we didn't know when, like if the AC was going to work, if the windows were going to go up and down. Um, there were no seats in the back. So we had to buy seats like that week. But for a little bit of time, it was my brother and I like just in the back. Um, and then we didn't know when it was going to turn on. Like, I remember my mom, like, be like, please, 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 let's just have it be green lights because we knew if it stopped at a red light, like sometimes it would like, yeah, it was just like that. <laughs> um, but slowly but surely, right. We had a couple, a couple of things that, that did happen. My parents were very entrepreneurial. Um, so my dad got a job as a cook, um, for a Peruvian restaurant, and then because of his entrepreneurial side, he began to then later become like the cook manager and then more of like the manager. And my mom became the waitress too. So then people began to think that, um, that they were the owners of, of the restaurant. And uh, there was a lot of sacrifice too that happened because we were in Miami and in Miami, like restaurants or like places close late. So I remember that my parents would work and we didn't have like the money to actually like to afford like somebody to take care of us every single time. Right. Of course, we had some family, but we were at the restaurant a lot. So I remember Fridays, for example, my parents will be there from 11 to like 10 p.m. Then karaoke night and we would be there at the restaurant from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. We would go back home, wake up and go back to the restaurant at 10, 30 or 11, work, my parents would work till 10 p.m. and then have like live music from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Saturday and going into Sunday and then back at the restaurant again at 10 a.m. Wow. And like, that was every weekend. Um, so it was just like, it was a lot of sacrifices, right? So a lot of the stuff that I do now, it's like basically, to show them that all of the effort, all of the sacrifices that they did to come to the United States and learn a new language and uh, go through all of those ups and downs, all of the hard times um, of us being able later to buy our first property and, and, and all of that stuff, right? The journey, um, a lot of the stuff that I do is like, they told me that the U.S. is the land of opportunity, but it is up to us to find it. Mm. And they showed me how to be resourceful despite our lack of papers. And uh, it's been a crazy journey, like I mentioned. Wow, that story of just, yeah, the sacrifice they made and, and that you made as kids as well, just being there and going along with it and saying, hey, we, this is what we have to do. It's just incredible. And I love, I love your, your parents' comments about, hey, this is a land of opportunity, but you're gonna have to go find it. It's not gonna, it's not gonna land on your doorstep. And mm -hmm. I, also, I also remember, Diego, and I'm going to uh, put a link to this, to your TED Talk, which I just found yeah. inc incredible. Um, you know, everybody needs to check out. It's a nice, concise version of, of your story. And But one of the, the comments I remember you saying in there was how your dad, basically, and your mom as well, taught that the, these are the, the values or the virtues that it means to us to be an American. Like this is the, the, work, the hard work, the integrity. And I just, I just feel like that story really demonstrates that, that, you know, the, you know, documents or no, here, here's your, your parents living that story that nobody's watching either late at night, they're having to work these long hours or doing what they're mm -hmm. just, they're just finding that opportunity. Like that, that, that is kind of the kernel of what to me at least is what it was, what it's all about. I just think it's a, a just to yeah. see, to see that, but also to see the, the foundation that you built upon and what you said, you're making, trying to make them proud for what they, they did to bring you here. Yeah. And, and it's crazy on that journey because a lot of people like now, for example, my, my, my parents own two Peruvian restaurants. I got my dad into real estate too, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, right? And, and I call my dad and I tell him, dad, there's this book that I'm reading. And it says, instead of you buying a car for 20,000 bucks, you buy a condo for 20,000. 
And then you use that money, that cash flow that's coming in to pay for that car. A week later, my dad calls me. And this is in 2011. Um, and he tells me, hey, I saw that. Or you told me last week about this idea, about this condo. And there's a condo for 20000 Should Should I buy it? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I just read, I'm reading this book. I have no idea. Uh, long story short, he bought it. That was his first rental property actually. And uh, he still has it to this day and it has triple or quadruple in price, I think now, and he's been giving him some passive income. Um, but now 20, we've been in the United States 22 years, I believe, uh, since 1999. And, um, man, like it's been, uh, it's been crazy because now they have the time to take off from work and work whenever they want to. They own two Peruvian restaurants and all this other stuff. And I feel like the sacrifice has paid off and a lot of people may see them now, but they, I always try to remind other people too. It's like, we started from zero. Hmm. We started from zero where like a lot, for example, for new years in 2000, my parents, instead of going out and celebrating that it's the year 2000, the millennium or whatever you call it, right? Um, We actually spend it. My parents were the waiter. Like my dad was a bartender. My mom was a waitress at a party and they took me and my brother. So I was out there hanging out with the kids, being on the dance floor, doing whatever uh, till seven in the morning. And, um, and so all night and they were, and they were working it. Right. So it's sort of like that, that work ethic that they showed me um, that sure, there's other people partying and celebrating and my parents are out there uh, working for the future for my brother and I. Yeah, love it. Well, I want to go back to your story, Diego. So you, yeah. you, you had your own work ethic. You, so you're in high school <laughs> and you were third in the class. Like, I mean, incredible. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, through that, you're, you're studying, you're diligent. It sounds like you were in the, into software when you went to college. Is that right? Did you major in, college. Co- in, in computer science or something in like that? IT. Yeah, IT. I graduated yeah. with IT. Got it. And so you, you know, you, you talked about some of the obstacles you hit there, just even getting a driver's license, getting student debt. I'm curious for those of who are either already in college or kind of think back about college, how, how did you end up paying for school at that point? Because you, you weren't able to just sign your name on a student loan. Like what, what did you do to, to make that work? Man. Okay. So this is, this is funny. Um, so I used to be the kid that would get the, the A's, right. I would set the curve. Uh, but in college, the, in college, the teachers would say, look, if you know the answers to these 20 questions or 30, whatever it was, you will get an A in the class. And I was like, well, that's easy. So then I would get, I would write down the question and go back to the book or the material, whatever. And, um, and basically I, I would memorize everything. Right. And so whenever, whenever I took the test, uh, I was the one who set the curve and there were people getting C's and or F's. And I'm like, he literally gave us the answers, like, like the questions of the test. Um, so what I did the next one on the Facebook group, because everybody was there. I'm like, hey guys, my name is Diego. I said, I was the one who said the curve. Uh, for the second exam, I'm going to sell the, st- I'm going to create a study guide and I'm going to sell you the study guide so that you, so that you can get an A. Um, so I made 300 bucks from exam number two. And then, oh, I'm sorry. It was $5. I made 300 bucks for, for $5. And I was going out in the middle of the streets, like outside, like meeting people in cars, giving them paper, and then they're giving me money. I'm like, man, I hope the police don't see that I'm trying to deal drugs or anything. Um, So it was a lot of work. So the next, for exam three, I sold it for $10 instead, right? Because now they saw. So it's all about economics and supply and demand. Uh, But I made $500 for for that semester from, from that class, for example. And that's how I was able to pay for for a couple of classes because I did that for for a few things. Um, then in me volunteering uh, for a nonprofit, they told me that they wanted me to work, um, but I couldn't. But I couldn't get paid. So I found out there were two ways. They could either create a scholarship. Check this out. I helped them. I showed them that they could 
create a scholarship just for me that I would win and it would go through FSU. And that's how I was able to get them to pay for, for me, for, for my work. Uh, and it was because, because it was a nonprofit, it was a lot easier. And then I found out that I could get a, like, uh, I could create my own company. So instead of getting paid as Diego, which I couldn't, uh, I, it got paid with my EIN number. Cause it's funny, like the government didn't want me to pay taxes as an employee, but I could pay as a business owner. So, um, so that's what I did. And I would ride my bike. Uh, in the hot summer weather, I would ride my bike to the appointments or to whatever I needed to do with a suit in my backpack, um, dry off with a towel, right? And then go to the go in the front of the building to meet my client or start work or whatever. But that's how I was able to pay for college, just working it. Love it. So the, there's a combination of, of hard work, of creativity, of entrepreneurship, of you know taking those lessons that you learned. And th th there's something you've talked about before, Diego, of just, you know, a lot of people would bump up against any of those, any one of those and say, all right, like, this is too much. Like, this is too high of a hurdle. Like, wh what was it in your head that said, all right, I'm just going to figure this out? Like, cause, because it, this is very relevant to real estate investing as well, any kind of business. Like, what, what was the, the thought process for you to say, I've just got to, I've got to figure this thing out? Yeah, I just, so there's two things. I follow the belief um, that if the door of opportunity is closed, I go through the window, right? I mentioned that in my TEDx talk. That's been the thing. And then I go back to the sacrifices that, again, that my parents had to go through that I'm like, look, I am totally fine. Like these are just small challenges compared to what my dad and my mom had had to do. Um so that causes me to become resourceful, to find a way to do it. Now I know, because my parents have told me, it's like, look, because we're in this situation, they will always tell me this as a child, hey, you can do whatever you want, but it's gonna take just a little bit more effort. So I always knew that, that there was always that extra effort to find a way. And I've been able to find my way into so many different places, so many different opportunities. Um, just by having the the skill of resourcefulness uh, being one of my superpowers. And then it also comes to the power of questions, right? And this is something that I learned years later, uh, but that's how I acted. I was like, okay, my situation, it sucks, but how can I use this? So instead of asking myself, why is this happening to me? I ask myself, why is this happening for me? So instead of taking the victim mentality, I've taken more the empower mentality and just find other solutions. Mm. Makes all the difference too, right? I mean, it, yeah. it, whatever situation you're in, having that, that question, I just want to repeat that. It's like, instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Which is like, not really, it's not going to help you much. It's going to just say, you know, maybe, maybe it is bad that it's happening to you, but that's just, that's the victim mentality. Whereas what you're saying is ask, how can I figure this out? Or how can I solve this? And that it, it implies like even that question by itself implies that there's an answer. It implies exactly. that there's some way to do it. So your brain's like, okay, like there's gotta be a way to do it. There's gotta be a way. So you're, you're, exactly. you're, you're activating that resourcefulness right there just with the question. Exactly. And looking for resourcefulness, but also opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a quick example. Um, so when because this example actually like changed my life. Um, when the Trump administration tried to take away the DACA program in 2017, he mentioned that we were stealing jobs from Americans. And then he was he threatened to cancel it. So for 30 days, we didn't know what was gonna happen. Like we had no idea. And um, and I took that. And I asked myself, okay, if they take the DACA program away, like there, my life will totally change, right? Because I'm not protected. I don't do anything, but I'm a big believer, like in my, myself asking me why this is happening for me. I was like, look, this is my opportunity to go out there, to share my story, to come out basically on the public and tell everybody that I'm a dreamer, um, that I'm part of the DACA program and that I am providing value to America. I'm not stealing from anybody. And in me doing so, I share my story on Facebook and I was nervous because I knew that I was gonna get haters. I knew that there was gonna be so much, so many things, but I took a picture of my taxes and, uh, and I mentioned, look, I'm 26 years old. I paid over 28,000 in taxes. I own eight properties. I employ Americans, all of this stuff. And that went viral. 
And that got me on Fox News Austin that weekend. It got me on Forbes, CNN Money. I've spoken in D.C. with congressmen multiple times from both sides of the aisle. And he has given me an opportunity to be uh, to be like um, an example, I would say, for the DACA community uh, and to other Americans, too, to show them, look, like despite your circumstances, if you really, really, really want to achieve your dreams, you can do it. You just have to work hard. Stories are powerful. And I, that's, that's one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on, Diego, because I feel like you know, you, somebody could give you that example. Hey, there's an opportunity out there. But then when you see it happen and when you see somebody who's run up against those obstacles, it makes all of us think, hey, well, how can I do that? How can I do it? And mm-hmm. what, one of the things I want to skip forward a little bit, Diego, because yeah. I, I do I, I do want to go to some of your house hacking and some of your stories. But I'm thinking a, a lot of people today and I know you talked to a lot of investors, too on their mind right now is like, oh my God, you know, real estate is so difficult. The pr- the prices are accelerating really quickly. And here I am a real estate investor trying to do it. When I, th- when I hear that, I, th- I think of your story. I say, okay, well, you know, Diego, somebody like Diego would, would ask that question. Like, all right, what's the opportunity here? How, or how can I make this work? Do you have any thoughts on that just today on what we're seeing? You live in Austin, Texas, which is one of the most highly appreciating markets in the country. Like, how are you thinking about that particular challenge and the opportunity behind it? Well, there's a couple of things. At the end of the day, is making sure that you have the right team, right? It's it's not just one person, but you have to be resourceful in being able to um, in being able to find the right people, find the right market, and analyze right what is your end goal with some properties? Because for somebody that's gonna be investing in Austin, it's not gonna be potentially for appreciation. So I'm gonna go into other markets. I've been buying, like I help people buy homes here in Austin, uh, some some investors, and they know that they're gonna be negative cash flow in around 300 bucks a door, let's say. But the appreciation factor of 15 to 20%, like we saw in the last like two years has been crazy. But for example, I'm still buying properties in other areas. I just, I, last year I bought a 16 unit in Augusta. Uh, well, it's in, it's in South Carolina. North Augusta. In the Augusta area. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. yeah. I know that and, well. Yeah. And then and I just closed on a 32 unit in Aiken, South Carolina. So, um, so there's, there's opportunity out there. You just have to search a little bit more and find out that and realize that it may not be technically in your backyard, especially unless you're house hacking. But if you are, if you're in a market where it has crazy appreciation, I would say go into cash flow in markets, but your team is the most important thing. Mm, I agree hundred percent. Yeah. I like how you pointed that out that, and that there's different markets have different strengths and that there's some people who have millions of dollars who just want to make sure their money doesn't go away and they have a good place to put it, who would rather buy in, in Austin, in Manhattan, in San Francisco, because those are huge markets with tons of inflow of people, tons of inflow of money. And for them, I mean, just for example, I'm just going to simplify numbers. If they were to pay cash for that property and it produced a 2% or 3% yield just on, from the rental income, that, that would be a negative cash flow on, a, on if you had to borrow money at 3 or 4%, right? But for that person, they might say, okay, well, I'm just putting my money somewhere. I'm making a little 2 or 3% yield, and I'm getting a maybe a, a 5 to 10% appreciation growth. Like that's, that makes sense. So like, so, so as an investor, we have to think about like, what's the purpose of that investment? Like you said, where you are, whereas a lot of us, you know, the small and mighty real estate investors, we have a limited amount of cash, cash to put down. We have a limit. We want to make cash flow. So then we need to look outside of into a different market that has a different criteria or a different goal that it can, you can achieve. So you, you've yeah. invested long distance. You, you have your job in Austin, you invest long distance in South Carolina and Tennessee and Florida and other places. Yeah. And here's the thing too, that's that I really like why real estate, why like the reason why I like real estate is because you just mentioned appreciation, right? but there's depreciation as well. You can depreciate that like the property taxes are tax deductible. There's so many things that just add to it. Um, so I feel like just because it's negative cash flow a little bit, I don't usually recommend that to the person that is like starting out. But if you're established, um, that's how I've done a couple of my investments now. It's more, hey, I may break even, but I know that if I do a cost study, 
I'm going to be able to depreciate so much and I'm not going to pay taxes on $50,000. Right. And that changes, that changes completely. Yeah, exactly. Once you start digging like two or three layers below the surface, you do your first deal or two, you just got to get some a base set, some basic metrics. But then if you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars, now you start thinking about tax optimization and how do I reduce my tax bill? Real estate's so, it's got so many different benefits at diff in different angles. So I, I agree hundred percent. Cool. So you, yeah. so, so right now the opportunity is build your team, look in different markets, depending on what you're looking for. I want to go back, like when you did your first deal, I want to talk specifically about financing and about how you actually get into a deal with little cash. Because I think there's a lot of people who are in that situation too. And that was, mm -hmm. a, that was an obstacle you faced, right? You had, you graduated from Florida State uh, or, and you went to work for GM and you read the Rich Dad Poor Dad and said, okay, like real estate, that's something I want to get into. Like what, what were your first moves there? Like how did you go from college student you know, I don't have any debt, but I don't have a lot of money to actually buying that first property. Yeah, I so the main thing here is that I realized that my biggest expense was my housing expenses. And I was already living in a like I was renting a room that somebody was technically house hacking. Right. And I was like, my gosh, this is like super smart. I need to do that. So I actually bought a uh, property in that same area, minutes away from, um, from GM, from my work. And I had to speak with tons of, tons of lenders because they didn't know what DACA was. So I actually had to cancel a couple of deals back in the past. Uh, but this lender told me, hey, you can totally do it. I got you pre-approved. You're good. So it was buying a property with 5% down, right? When you're living in a property to whether you're house hacking or at least owner occupant, there's the USDA loan, VA loan, which can be zero money down, FHA loan and conventional loans, which is three to 5% down. So I was able to buy this house in, in Austin for 170. And the way it's been appreciating here in Austin now is that's worth around 400. It's mm. crazy. I bought it in 2014 put 5% down. So for less than $10,000, I saved money uh, while I was working at GM and I lived in the master bedroom. My rent, I'm sorry, the mortgage was going to be $1,350 and I was going to be able to rent out each room for $550, which meant that I had an additional $300 bucks, um, in cash flow or for reserves or whatever. But I used those $300 to pay for my car payment too. Mm -hmm. So since 24 years old, I have lived for free and I've had my car payment paid by assets, right? So instead of collecting, collecting bills, I'm collecting assets that pay for my bills. Mm. And uh, that's, that's how I started. And in the beginning, some of my friends were like, why are you living with roommates? You're making good money working at General Motors. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Uh, but for me, it was like, look, you have way many, you have different goals than I do. Like I want to own 10 properties by 35, hmm. like that's where I'm going. And um, yeah, but that was my, that was my, my first deal in Austin as a house hack. Yeah. It's just amazing to me, Diego, how many real estate investor friends I have got started with a very similar story. Like your, your, yours was the house where you rented three bedrooms out. Mine was a fourplex where I rented three, uh, three units out. But before that, I lived in a house that I rented out to my brother and, and it was just getting a little too expensive. And I'm like, all right, I need to get the fourplex. And, but there's so many people get, because there's so many benefits to getting that first deal as a house hack. And with the low down payment, with the owner occupant financing, with being able to rent that out and, and just that it's almost addicting. I don't know if you feel this way, Diego, like when you, when you finally start getting to this place where your income pays for at least one of your expenses, like it's paying for your housing and your car, like, for me, I can't, it's hard to go back from that. It's like, wow, like, why, how could I ever not have assets paying for my lifestyle? Like, it's just, it's beautiful. It's just, then you just get scale it. Like, what else can I pay for with another investment? And it, that, that's exactly. the game, that's the game, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And here's the thing is that a lot of people think that you need millions of dollars in the bank to retire. And that is not true. You just imagine that you house hack once a year or every two years, because the key here too, that not many people know is that you can qualify for an owner occupant loan once a year. So you can literally, and of course, 
if you sell it, you pay taxes two out of the last five years, but the goal is not to sell them, right? So you can buy a house, because this is what I did. I was living there and I was making 300 bucks. The next year I buy another house with low money down again. And now I move out of this house, house number one, now I'm making a thousand bucks a room. I mean, at the house and, I, and I'm living for free in house number two. So now I have a thousand in cash flow. And then that begins to add, then I buy another one. Then once you have more cash flow, I begin to buy rentals instead of just house hacking. And then boom, 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 boom. I, that's how I grew my portfolio in the beginning. It began to get momentum. Yeah, and it seems it seems like a slow start, like that that snowball that Warren Buffett talks about. You know, it's like that little snowball, and when you first start doing it, it's a little bitty snowball. Okay, a couple hundred bucks here, five hundred bucks here, but man, when that snowball really comes together, and sometimes it takes three years, sometimes it takes five, sometimes it takes ten, but mm-hmm. it'll it, it'll come, and then it's like it, it's just it can be almost you know can cover the whole the whole amount. I mean, that's that's when things really get interesting and a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you if you if you're in appreciating market, right? Right now is the best time for any house hackers or anybody that does have properties to see if you can get HELOCs or lines of credit from your houses, um, so that you potentially can um, can get those like that big of a line of credit because then that can that can give you the money for future rentals that you can put twenty percent down or or whatever. But now you're playing with equity rather than you trying to save money and put it in a bank. Right, got it. So so let's talk about some more tools, like the tool you use to get started, house hacking with a low money down loan. That's an awesome tool. If people could just do that one, that might be all you have to do in some cases. What, what were some other strategies that you had to use? Because you, you had to be creative. I had to do the same thing early in my career for just for different reasons. But you know, what were some other ways that you were able to then go to the next step and then the next step to get the money, to find the deals. Talk to me a little bit more about your strategies from there. Yeah, this is a good question because basically what I did is I realized that the owner occupant loans, uh, it was going to be easy for me to save not that much money, right? But if I wanted to grow my portfolio, one of the best strategies was to partner with somebody. And by partnering is I leverage my superpower or what I was good at and I had to leverage somebody else's superpower, which at that point it could have been money, right? So one of the things that I did in the beginning to grow my portfolio is I hit up one of my friends um, and he had money. So I told him, look, this is what I did for this house. Why don't we buy four bedroom homes around the Austin area and I can manage it I can find a deal. I'm the one that knows the real estate market. I'm the realtor. I know all this. You just have to front the money. Uh, He was like, sure. So we bought three properties like that and uh, in partnering up. And that's how we increase the cash flow. So instead of renting it to a family, we rent it by the room. And it did require a little bit more work, but like I'm in my 20s, right? I was in my 20s back then. Uh, so it made it super easy for me to just f- figure it out. If if I had to work to make it happen, I'm building for my future. So we rented by the room. Then that was one strategy. Then another partner hit me up years later. And in 2017, 2018, I started buying short-term rentals in the Gatlinburg area. So now I own 15 over there with a business partner, uh, which like it was, it's been awesome too, because that market has appreciated. And, um, and yeah, so th- using different strategies, the short term rentals, the renting by the room, I was buying some properties cash in Jacksonville too. Um, because of my brother, he's a wholesaler over there. And it was just great trying to do different things. And then later deciding like, why not do 1031 exchanges? So I did that once too from a quadplex that was old and needed to do a lot of work. I used a 1031 strategy to buy a brand new quadplex. And yeah, that's, those are some of the tools that I use. I love it. So, so short-term rentals, 1031 exchanges. We also got into, of course, house hacking. Were, were there any specifically with a rent by the room strategy? There's there's always some little. Sometimes it's a legal angle. Sometimes it's a you know local zoning kind of restriction or something. Did, did you find any anything that was an obstacle that some people had to, to renting by the room that y'all that you solved that were that, because there's a lot of if you have a four bedroom house 
and you can rent four bedrooms, you're, you're going to get more cash flow doing that than you are sometimes just renting it to one person. Um, so that's the benefit. But like, what were some of the obstacles to being able to rent by the room? The obstacles were making sure that the roommates would be comfortable with each other um, and the parking, just making sure that there was going to be no issues with the parking. So we made sure that in the houses that, for example, it wasn't just a little town home kind of thing uh, that people could park on the streets or in the driveway and there was going to be no, no issue with that. Uh, for some people too, some states may require that legally there's no more than three unrelated people here in austin i believe it's four or five so that was our max but i know that in other areas it it can be and then you can get caught if if it happens but if it doesn't happen then you're right. good um i know that with hoas sometimes they say that you cannot do that but if you're just careful enough it would be fine um but you, you just have to be a little bit more on the careful side yeah. And you said the keyword, you, you find out what your local ordinances are. And I, like in Clemson, for example, I'm in a college town. And in the past, sometimes, you know, re regulations start to try to solve a problem that was a, a problem 30 years ago. And there were, you know, the big college houses where people would get six or seven people in a house and they would just, mm -hmm. the neighbors would complain. So they, they, they formed some uh, ordinances in Clemson where you have to get a rental license and you have no more than two people who aren't related to each other. So like if, even a four bedroom house, you can only rent to two people. So it's basically eliminated house houses from the kind of multiple people in a house market. I can still rent to two people in that house, but mm -hmm. it's just the economics don't work as well. So typically I rent to families to house for houses and then I'll get, but then there's other zoning in town. And here's where the local knowledge like you have as a realtor and a local investor, like you can find certain zoning does allow four people in a house or in a, an apartment. So if you had a house that was in a multifamily zoning area, you could rent all four bedrooms in that house, but it, it all has to do with what the zoning is underneath that house. So that's where it yeah. really, it really pays to, to learn your local laws and read all that boring kind of like text in the zoning amendments. Like there's so much, there's so much money to be made in those boring little footnotes of your, your zoning in your local town. Yeah. I mean, if you go the extra mile, you find opportunities. That's it's as simple as that. Just yeah. making sure that you're investing the right way uh, because you might have. And that also takes out some of the competition. Yeah. Right. Like I'm OK with working a little bit harder and some other investors might not or they might like, oh, no, in this whole area, you cannot rent by the room. And then you found that, no, in this specific maybe it's a county. Right. If your city has other counties, maybe it's just one county that you cannot do that. But you think that it's all the counties. So just going the extra mile, you can find opportunities. Yeah, I'm seeing a theme here, Diego, like whether it's financing or whether it's the zoning, like find that opportunity. It's like, ask that question. I'm just gonna keep repeating that. Um, what, one of the things that I was impressed with in your story too, was that you know the, the financing is a, is a hurdle for so many investors. And a lot of people get stuck on that and say, that's one of those things that, like, well, I can't do this. I'm a victim. I can't make any, this, I can't grow anymore as a real estate investor. And you, you took that leap from owner occupant financing to getting a partner and, and letting the other person put up the money. Were, were there any things, you know, obstacles to practically speaking to getting that done? I mean, you had a friend who had some money. It sounded like you just kind of asked him and said, here's the deal. Like, do you have any tips for other people who are trying to make that first pitch to somebody who's going to put up the money and they have sort of that conversation in their head? Maybe they're nervous about it or they're uncertain about it. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. And it, be, it becomes more of an aspect of like, you have to understand that you're providing value to somebody. And if you if you heard me earlier, I mentioned the word unfair advantage or superpower, right? So it's something that you have that other people may not have. Now, if you tell somebody, hey, I'm looking for real estate and I have a million dollars cash, and then you talk to somebody, hey, I have a million dollars cash as well, can we partner up? And it's like, sure, but you're gonna need somebody else because if you guys don't know anything else about real estate, Right. So that's why it's not always good to partner with somebody that has the same things like you. You want to partner up with people that may have that, that their strengths are not exactly the same at, at that time. So what that means is that for somebody, you have to understand that if you're just bringing the deal or the market knowledge or the opportunity, you know that you're bringing value to that person. And it's up to you to just find the right partner that are like, you know what? that deal totally makes sense for me because for some people it may not make sense 
Some people are looking, hey, I only invest in 15% cash on cash return. Other are like, dude, I'm an attorney. I just need to store cash. As long as I get more than 8%, I'm good or something like that, right? So mm-hmm. you have to have, number one, enough conversations so that you can find that right partner, especially if you're looking for money. But you have to understand that you're bringing value to them by providing deals and things that they that you're helping them with something. Maybe they have the money, but no time. And you have all the time in the world. Yeah. So, so forth. Yeah, that's a big mental shift, I think. I, I remember having to do the same thing. The, the realization that there's more money out there in the world looking for deals than there are deals with trustworthy people. So like for somebody to invest with Diego, who's trustworthy, and he's able to find a deal that makes cash flow or builds wealth, like that's not a common thing. So if you have that, if you're a trustworthy person, which I'm assuming people listening to this, at least most of you, you know, you're going to do it the right way, right? And then you're also going to find a good deal. Like there's tons of people out there who need to invest with you. And that, that was actually how I, Diego, when I first started, because um, I didn't have a, I didn't have a regular W-2 income kind of job. I had to go to private investors. I had to use self-directed retirement accounts. And I, I taught a bunch of you know, people who are much wealthier than I was, but I taught them how to use a self-directed retirement account to loan me money to do my deals. You know, yeah. There's an op- opportunity. So it's kind of that idea, but without that mental shift that you're talking about, realizing that they're, you're adding a lot of value to people that they need you. Like they, they need you as much or more than you need them in some cases. And yeah. so even as a new investor, if you can have that mentality, then there's really the sky's the limit on how much money you can get. I've never had an obstacle of getting money for my deals after that realization, because then you start looking at the numbers and like the amount of money that's in retirement accounts out there sitting there making like half a percent interest is like exactly. tr- trillions of dollars, right? I mean, it's just an mm-hmm. enormous. And if you're if you're a small and mighty investor just trying to buy 10 properties, five properties, 20 pro- I mean, you, you can get all the money you need. It's just doing what you're talking about, talking to people, putting a plan together and presenting it to them. And that's, that's really cool that that's how you took that next step. And now, now, so what, what's the kind of end result for you? Like you have 40 something units now you have multiple States. I'm just want to kind of let's take a step back and look at where you've come from since the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. So what's going next? Uh, I am going to be investing a little bit more into syndications uh, cause as I, as I grow like my realtor business and my brand with Red Race 2FI, um, I want to invest more into syndications and then raising capital that's coming next for me. And in, in 2022, that's my goal, raise some capital and start being a GP on certain syndications so that I can start to build equity from, from that perspective. So I'm trying to learn as much as I can partner again with the right people. Because again, I'm going to be my superpower from that perspective is I can raise capital, but I may not know what market yet. I may not know like the location and who, like what type of property yet. I will leave that to that partner until the right deal comes. So, but definitely going into bigger apartment units. Just incredible. Love it, Diego. So much wisdom you've got, you've had from experience and from your your different challenges you've met along the way. Just think it's so awesome. I know a lot of people are going to take take some uh, practical steps from this, but also some inspiration on what they can do in their own life. And I want to wrap it up with a couple questions. One is yeah. that one that one that I ask all of our, our guests here is th- this is a show about ultimately it's about financial independence. It's about you invest in real estate, you do all this so you have a lot of time to do what matters. But some of the people listening to this, many of them are kind of in the grind, you know, they're in that stage where they're early on, they're trying to save that first down payment, they're trying to grow. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if you if you look back at when you were in that stage as well, do you have any any tips for them that might be kind of a final tip to help them kind of make some progress where they are journeying towards financial independence? Yeah, for the people that are trying to get started, right, that are like, hey, I am... I'm trying to like, I'm, I'm just trying, I would say, okay, go from trying to actually doing it. And you can get analysis paralysis by not, by, by not trying to hit a home run in your first time. I just want people to get to first base, just get to first base. That's the most important thing. And for people that are out there already growing their portfolio or going for property one, but they're like, oh my gosh, how do I get to property number two or three? Again, just start swinging the bat and get to base number two, get to base number three. And later, like once you get the momentum, you'll see the results. But if you're not taking action, you you won't see any any of the results. 
that's that's what I would say. And and to know your numbers. Yeah, got it. Get to that get that first deal or two under your belt, and then you'll go to the the University of Hard Knocks, the real the re- real world university, and then you can grow from there. Great. Exactly. Awesome, awesome tip. All right. Now I know you have a lot going on, so I want to hand it off to yes. you. Just to, to, you know, you have a, a podcast you're doing and some other stuff. So just feel free to tell everybody what you're up to, and then I will uh, put a link in the show notes as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So um, I am one of the partners, one of the founders of Rad Race Two FI, where we help people get out of the rat race into financial independence via real estate. And we have the Red Race to FI podcast where we share the stories of people that are on their journey to FI um, and people that have gotten to FI. So, Chad, we definitely have to have you in the future, too. Absolutely. I know our audience can learn tons. Um, so, to. yeah. So, so we have that going on. We, last year, we did our first event for goal setting into the real estate conference kind of thing. And um, we had over 120 people. We're going to be doing that later this year. So it's exciting as we share our stories, as we create more impact, because we felt like uh, a lot of people. Num- n- n- so we feel like like a lot of people, sometimes they couldn't identify with somebody. Right. And me being a DACA recipient and all this other stuff, we were able to get a lot of people that reached out and were like, holy crap, Diego, I want to do what you do. So we create a platform for that, helping people get out of the rat race from all walks of life, which is my favorite thing. Um, And letting them know that no matter where they are in their journey, number one, they're worthy and they deserve the financial independence if they work hard enough and smart enough. Not just working hard, you have to work smart. And um, and yeah, by knowing your goals, finding your why, that's what we do at Rat Race 2FI. Beautiful. You know, one of the the things I love about you know, this greater kind of financial independence community and people are educating like you, you're doing. And, um, it's just, there, there's so many different stories that need to be told. And I, I just, I love that you're, you're, you know, that people can listen and they can identify with, with the teacher, with the podcast that just resonates with them. And, mm-hmm. and I just, I'm really glad that y'all are doing what you're doing and happy to support that. And, and there's a, there's a, the, the Ultimately, you know, the American story is still being written, I think. And I, I think that's what's cool about your your TED talk that inspired me so much when I first saw it is that, you know, we, we this this journey of financial independence is really it's kind of a personal journey, too. This is people trying to overcome challenges. They're trying to help their family. They're trying to leave legacies. And it's, it's really fun to see people's light bulbs click when they're like, OK, this one property or these two properties can make a huge difference and lots of people's lives down the road. So I'm excited about it, excited about what you guys are up to. And I will put links to all of that in the show notes. And just want to thank you, Diego, for coming on to talk. It's been a lot of fun. No, yeah, for sure. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And for anybody that does want to reach out or have questions, they can follow me on Instagram at realdiegocorzo.com. I mean, at realdiegocorzo. Yeah, that's it. I got it. I'll put the put that in the link and we definitely need to stay in touch and let me know if I can help you out on the podcast or come on there. Love love to talk to you as well. For sure. Thank you, chat. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please join me again next Monday for another interview. Actually, I have another interview with someone who immigrated to the United States and bought real estate, but this time from India. So Gordon Lopez is the person I'm interviewing. He lives in California and invests across the country and finds all sorts of ways to find deals, to make progress, to finance his properties while working a full-time job across the country. So a really fascinating story. I hope you'll join me. That's next Monday. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risk. 
Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.